Greetings and welcome back to 303 in Junior English. Let's finish with our conversation regarding William Faulkner. I'm with you on page 828-829, um, no, the Nobel Prize acceptance speech. Let's look, read a little bit of background information here really quickly on 828. Swedish chemist Alfred Nobel earned fame as the inventor of dynamite. So the Nobel Prize is actually uh, founded on a guy who invented dynamite. Nobel has had indeed uh, had, had intended dynamite to be used safely in mining and construction, but disasters often occurred and his name became associated with tragedy. Nobel eventually succeeded in making dynamite safer. Later, he established a foundation to encourage achievement and diplomacy. The Nobel Prizes, the uh, world's most prestigious awards, are the result of his efforts. When William Faulkner received the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1950, he delivered a speech that is among the most moving examples of oratory in our, in our literature. Go ahead and jot down in your notes really quickly that this speech was delivered in Stockholm, Sweden, December the 10th, 1950. Let's just make a couple of quick observations then we're going to listen to the speech. Uh, in his gracious acceptance speech, Faulkner expresses his concern that the question of physical survival has diverted young writers from dealing with with what truly matters in life and literature, love, honor, compassion, sacrifice. He states his belief that humanity will not only endure, but also prevail because human beings alone possess an immortal soul and compassionate spirit. The writer is both obliged and privileged to remind humanity of its nobler capacities and thus can help ensure the success of the human race. Let's go ahead and just read along starting uh, um, with some general observations at the beginning, all right? Here we go. Pay attention, follow along. Nobel Prize Acceptance Speech by William Faulkner. Stockholm, Sweden, December 10th, 1950. I feel that this award was not made to me as a man, but to my work. A life's work in the agony and sweat of the human spirit not for glory and least of all for profit, but to create out of the materials of the human spirit something which did not exist before. So this award is only mine in trust. It will not be difficult to find a dedication for the money part of it commensurate with the purpose and significance of its origin. But I would like to do the same with the acclaim too, by using this moment as a pinnacle from which I might be listened to by the young men and women already dedicated to the same anguish and travail, among whom is already that one who will someday stand here where I am standing. Our tragedy today is a general and universal physical fear so long sustained by now that we can even bear it. There are no longer problems of the spirit, there is only the question, when will I be blown up? Because of this, the young man or woman writing today has forgotten the problems of the human heart in conflict with itself, which alone can make good writing, because only that is worth writing about, worth the agony and the sweat. He must learn them again. He must teach himself that the basest of all things is to be afraid. And teaching himself that, forget it forever. Leaving no room in his workshop for anything but the old verities and truths of the heart. The old universal truths, lacking which any story is ephemeral and doomed. Love, and honor, and pity, and pride and compassion, and sacrifice. Until he does so, he labors under a curse. He writes not of love, but of lust, of defeats in which nobody loses anything of value, of victories without hope, and worst of all, without pity or compassion. His griefs grieve on no universal bones, leaving no scars. He writes not of the heart, but of the glands. Until he relearns these things, he will write as though he stood among and watched the end of man. 
I decline to accept the end of man. It is easy enough to say that man is immortal simply because he will endure, that when the last ding-dong of doom has clanged and faded from the last worthless rock hanging tideless in the last red and dying evening, that even then there will still be one more sound, that of his puny, inexhaustible voice still talking. I refuse to accept this. I believe that man will not merely endure, he will prevail. He is immortal, not because he alone among creatures has an inexhaustible voice, but because he has a soul, a spirit capable of compassion and sacrifice and endurance. The poet's, the writer's duty is to write about these things. It is his privilege to help man endure by lifting his heart, by reminding him of the courage and honor and hope and pride and compassion and pity and sacrifice which have been the glory of his past. The poet's voice need not merely be the record of man. It can be one of the props, the pillars, to help him endure and prevail. All right, let's turn now just for a few seconds to do a quick annotation of this really famous speech. You can see that the speech really kind of breaks into two parts, right? First, obviously, Faulkner is going to say that I'm not really, you know, uh, worthy of this as a human, but I will take this prize by virtue of the work that I've done. Then the second part of the speech, and obviously the more important part of the speech, is to talk about modern writers people who are his contemporaries, but who are younger. And about that group, he says, I'm worried. I'm worried. And the reason he says that he's worried is because he says, these writers only write about surviving. The biggest concern, of course, is the modern challenge, right? He says, the only question is, when will I be blown up? Surviving, right? But he says, we must learn certain things again. We must, he says, he must teach himself the basis of all things is to be afraid. That is to say, to fear that you're not going to survive or whatever. And then he has the list, the old verities, the truths of the heart, the old universal truths. Right? And he has a list, love and honor and pity and pride and compassion and sacrifice. Notice that same list ends up at the very end of the speech a few lines later, right? He makes the observation that if you don't have these, you reduce things that are sacred to things that are not. Love becomes lust, and so on. Notice finally a statement of profound hope. I decline to accept the end of man, or the end of humanity, right? I refuse, he says, to accept that in the end the human voice dies out. I believe that man will not merely endure he will prevail. And why? Because Faulkner says he has a soul, a spirit capable of compassion and sacrifice and endurance. Right? Finally, he finishes with what is the writer's duty. Write about those things, the things that matter. Right? The poet's voice need not merely be the record of man, it can be one of the props, the pillars to help him endure, and then final word, prevail. All right, let's go ahead at level one really quickly and, I, and, and summarize what it is that he's saying here. Of course, this is a tremendous speech of great hope. The, the, uh, the uh, voice of Faulkner here is to say, we mustn't give in to fear, right? We must continue to believe in the future and have hope for the future. Be optimistic, we might say. At uh, 2A, major themes, messages, some have said that this is a tremendous statement for all would-be artists that the greatest art is the art that remembers those eternal truths, right, of compassion, sacrifice, endurance, those kinds of, uh, those kinds of ultimate realities, we might say. Another possible message here is the belief that the human spirit will survive. It will go on, that it will continue to fight, and ultimately, the last word of his speech, prevail. At 2B, rhetorically speaking, of course, it's a brilliantly constructed speech. It begins with humility and ends with encouragement. It, it ends with this 
powerful statement of hope, right? It's a speech that has then been uh, read and embraced by large numbers of artists after he gave this speech. I decline to accept the end of man. Finally, level three, how does this relate to other speeches? Immediately we think of other famous speeches in American history. The Martin Luther King Jr. I Have a Dream speech comes to mind, right? And other speeches that you maybe are familiar with that you could jot down. Speeches about hope. You might think about other titles where there has been some challenge to be hopeful. We immediately think, for example, of Longfellow's Psalm of Life, in this world's broad field of battle, in the bivouac of life, be not like dumb, driven cattle, be a hero in the strife, the suggestion that you've got to keep striving, you've got to keep working right, for the soul is dead that slumbers and things are not what they seem. Longfellow says, life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal, dust thou art to dust returnest, was not spoken of the soul. You'll, of course, point out here that uh, Faulkner mentions the same thing, that what makes humans so important to the planet is that humans have a soul, a spirit that will prevail, a drive. And finally, of course, what do you take away as a personal statement here from this? What are your thoughts about which is more important, to be afraid or to be hopeful, right? To always be worried or to always be excited about the future? And as you think about your own life, which of those two for you is the easier? Which for you of uh, those two is the hardest? Here's another way to think about it. When in your life can you remember being the most afraid? And when in your life can you remember being the most at peace, unafraid, the most hopeful? If you are an individual who is predominantly optimistic, ask yourself the simple question, why? If you are an individual who suffers with being pessimistic, ask yourself, why? I hope that William Faulkner's Nobel Prize acceptance speech has given you some sense of hope and encouragement. Thank you.